All right, welcome to Studio Art Project 3. Today we're going to work with text in the project I'm calling Text Message. And you are going to learn about artists that communicate um, through the use of text in their artwork. And then you are going to create something with text. So the first artist that we're going to look at is um, Mark Bradford. And this is um, a picture called 150 Portrait Tone, made in 2017. Uh, Mark Bradford was born in 1961 in Los Angeles, California, where he lives and works. And he was the artist selected for the Venice Biennale in in 2017. Um, so that's a tremendous honor. When um, the Venice Biennale is an art show that happens in Venice every other year. And when an artist is selected, um, many countries present and are represented. And the US, among many other countries, has a pavilion, meaning a building that they have um, as part of the Biennale that they send an artist to represent the country. And Mark Bradford was chosen for this prestigious honor in 2017. Um, he's also a MacArthur uh, Fellow, um, and he's won many awards and um, is a very, very major artist. Um, and this particular work is based on an idea for a work that the artist conceived after the fatal shooting of um, Philando Castile by police by a police officer in St. Paul, Minnesota in July of 2016. Um, and it features excerpts of Reynolds' di dialogue from a video that was made um, by his girlfriend while he um, was, was shot, or, or sorry, prior to being shot. Um, and the context of this painting is that the, this title represents a sobering commentary on, the, on power and representation because it's named after um, a color tone um, that was, um, it's like a color code of a pink, pink acrylic paint used that he used throughout the painting. So now I'm going to show you um, a video um, of him. It's called Wild Wild West and it's a beautiful rant by Mark Bradford. It was uh, shown at Sundance. It's a very short film. Um, and he talks about his process and his work. And the re one of the major reasons I'm choosing it is he talks about materials and um, sort of uh, how materials are important to him and how they don't need to, you know, they can be just paper or making paper look like paint and um, mimicking and using, um, you know, paper that may not be the most expensive art material, but using it to convey certain ideas. Um, and um, yeah, enjoy. I don't like when people say, oh, he's an actor slash waiter. No, his job to get money is to be a waiter. Don't take his life from him, he's an actor. And if he never is ever in anything until he dies and he says he's an actor, he's an actor. Pisses me off. Don't take that away from people. Don't professionalize it, well, what have I seen you on? Don't worry about that. A person has made paintings his whole life and they're all under his bed. He calls himself an artist and by the day he works at Home Depot, he's an artist. I was born on the fringe. Me and my mama. I was born in a boarding house. You can't get more fringe than that. I knew where I came from, but I was only interested in where I was going. It's the same thing with materials. I don't really care they come from the streets and merchant pub. I'm interested in where they're going. And they're going to alchemy and they're going to have conversations about other things. They take off and become something else. They're no longer paper from the streets. They take flight and they become something else. They become part of a conversation about art and about painting. Where they start off, so what? It's like me. Let me see a little bit of the edges of the paper. You can tell they come from the streets a little bit, but look at them now. It's like me. You can tell I got a little bit, you know. Why the paper? Because I had to work for it. I have to work for it. Paper is very unforgiving, but I wanted to look like paint. I wanted to sit right next to a, a beautiful oil painting. I want my paintings to be historicized with the great painters. I want to be at that table. Contemporary art should not belong to, and it does not belong to, 
any culture or any class of people. I don't believe. It's just the ideas, ideas of our time. I guess rebelling for me was really wanting to have a dialogue with the mainstream. But I'm taking all this raggedy ass material and demanding that it will have the potentiality to have the same gravitas as old paintings. I'm sure that's psychologically me. Taking humble stuff and demanding that that humble stuff has access and a shot at anything they want. Yep, that would be me. That paper for me is unforgiving and it's rough and it, it's not fluid and elegant. It's, it's hard and rough material. It won't bend and it won't become fluid. And that's my job, to make it ignite, to make it take off, to make it feel like paint. Demanding that it become something that it wasn't born to be. Yeah, that sounds like me. We've all come from somewhere, but it's not where you come from, it's where you're going. Be proud of where we come from. We come from the fringe. We stand at the fringe and critique and look at things. You should always be proud because we have mobility out in the Wild West. We're iconoclastic. We can do whatever we want, say what we want and everything. We're not bound. You know, when you come from the Wild Wild West, you always got that little in you that you can leave all this behind. For real. Artists, we visit. And then we go back to the Wild Wild West. Where do you think innovation comes from? Where do you think it comes from? when Dr. Dre was in that room. Where do you think innovation comes from? It comes from Wild Wild West. Where do you think everything comes from? Just being out there and saying, well, I'm gonna do it because I want to. That's where innovation comes from, true innovation. Spend a little time, and go back to whatever road you're on. Don't worry about it if you haven't seen it before, invent it. For our next artist, I'm going to talk about Par Barbara Kruger. Um, she was born in 1945 in New York, New Jersey, um, and she went to um, she first attended Syracuse University and then the School of Visual Arts and then Parsons School of Design, um, which are all famous. You know, but the final second two are famous art schools in New York. Um, but she never finished her fine arts degree. Um, and she needed to go to work, she needed to make money, and so she was able to land a job with Condé Nast Publications and quickly rose to the position of chief designer at Mademoiselle. So she had this really solid background in um, magazines and commercial and design. Um, but she was inspired by Hannah Huck, who we saw before, and um, the, that is the feminist Dada artist who um, pioneered photo montage techniques. 
Um, and in the late 70s and early 80s, she arrived at her signature style, um, which often critiqued capitalism and patriarchy through images and words juxt juxtaposed together. Um, and she really didn't say much about, so, so I'm sure this is familiar imagery to you guys or familiar graphic design um, technique um, because Supreme, um, which is a very popular brand of clothing, um, skatewear, things like that, is um, uses this. And she, she didn't really confront that um, when it first started becoming popular. Um, but when Supreme then tried to sue another uh, designer for using their quote unquote style, um, she decided she had enough. So she did a show called Untitled in 2017, or I'm sorry, Untitled The Drop. So the drop like when a clothing line drops. And um, it was a performance responding to the to Supreme's appropriation of her work. And so she opened a store and she had this sort of like store-like um, experience where you went in and you saw her artwork, but in a very um, shopping sort of context and then work like the work you see in front of you. So I'm going to show you a video um, of her also talking about her work. Um, this is from LACMA um, and she addresses just, you will get a, a large um, survey of the kind of work she does. I really never thought I could be an artist in the art world sense of it. I didn't know anything about art worlds. I never had gone to museums. I had to get a job. So I left school when I was around 19 and just started working as an editorial designer at magazines. I would basically look at all the photographs that came in, and I didn't have the text from the copywriters yet, so I would just place text over the photographs that said A, B, C, D, E, and they would write to my design. And what I realized is that my job as a designer pretty quickly morphed into my work as an artist. I work with pictures and words because I think they have the ability to tell us and remind us where we've come from and where we're going. They have powers and pleasures and desires and disgusts. I'm very interested in the everyday. I love the everyday and its repetitions, its comforts. It's the events that make me nuts. I like the moments between events. I see myself within this pleasurable yet brutal culture. But I think that like most artists, I try to create commentary. You know, I've always said I have a short attention span, which connects me to digital culture. I went online and I found 500 images based on certain stylistics of my work. And I constructed a work using those images, none of which were made by me. The way my still images have traveled online in various forms done by myself and other people <laughs> is satisfying and amusing to me. I curated a show at the Museum of Modern Art 
which I called picturing greatness, but the word greatness was in quotes. There were two texts, and they were on the wall in the middle of the room, surrounded by images of artists. And the text basically focused on the arbitrariness of fame and prominence. There are so many visual practitioners whose work we don't know. And the reason is sometimes brutally arbitrary. I resist great claims made for my work. One of the great joys of being able to project your subjectivity into an image or an object or a building. It means you don't have to be there physically. You don't have to be the face of your work. So for the next um, artist that uses or uses a uh, text in their work, it's actually not an artist as much as a genre and a group of people or a style of art. Um, we're going to look at graffiti and um, we're going to look at modern graffiti that um, the sort of earlier forms from the 70s and 80s. Um, and I have a clip um, from this movie called Style Wars, which is kind of a cult classic. Uh, it was directed by Tony Silver in 1983, um, and it's just a great document, to, you know, documentation um, of this early of the early forms, um, the early times of hip hop. Um, and so, I will let the film speak for itself. Bring the train out from 16, try. Let's 
Chicken Hill Gang with the pow pow boogie and a big bang bang. They call themselves writers because that's what they do. They write their names, among other things, everywhere. Names they've been given or have chosen for themselves. Most of all, they write in and on subway trains, which carry their names from one end of the city to the other. It's called bombing. And it has equally assertive counterparts in rap music and break dancing. Graffiti writing in New York is a vocation. Its traditions are handed down from one youthful generation to the next. To some, it's art. To most people, however, it is a plague that never ends. A symbol that we've lost control. I'm Detective Bernie Jacobs. I, in conjunction with my partner, Detective Jim McHugh, are the crime prevention coordinators for the New York City Transit Police Department. Graffiti, as the name itself, is not an art. Graffiti is the application of a medium to a surface. I will show you graffiti, such as the letters on the end of that car directly in back of me. Is that an art form? I don't know, I'm not an art cr critic. But I can sure as hell tell you that that's a crime. At the Grand Concourse, 149th Street Station in the Bronx, graffiti writers gather at what they call the writer's bench. They're saying that the kids run the subways, that the system is out of control, that 15 and 16 year old kids are running the system, and that graffiti is a symbol of that. Nah, I ain't running the system. Hell yeah. I'm bombing the system. <laughs> They're trying to make it look like graffiti riders break windows and everything. It ain't even like that, you know? So, for the next um, artist, um, this is a collaboration between two artists, Miranda July and Harold Fletcher, and it's in a project they did called Learning to Love You More. And so the project was a website that you could go to or log on to and see an art assignment and then you would create the assignment and then you would upload it back your results back to the assign back to the web page and share it so it was a way that they were um creating art with people um, on a broad scale they had done some of this in galleries and other ways too but this website is what kind of rose in popularity and then actually was purchased by, I believe, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. So it's a website that's owned by um, a museum as a work of art. So here you'll see assignment number 63. So if you go to this website, um, it's no longer active. You cannot participate with it, but you can see the remnants of what happened. Um, and so on the left, you'll see all of these numbered assignments. And if you click on it, like assignment number three, uh, 63, you can, um, it tells you how to, the directions that they have for, for asking you to make an encouraging banner. Um, and then once you make the assignment, you upload a photograph and, um, and it comes in it becomes part of this group of what they call reports. So if you look on the right side, these are all the people that contributed to this assignment. Um, and so, and it's from all over the world. You can see this is what, one's from Australia, um, from New York, and from Wisconsin. And I even saw um, at Bumper Shoot a number of years ago, um, there was an exhibit from this and there was a family that completed every single assignment um, on the Learning to Love You More website and had posted it. So for our project, um, we're going to do, we're going to also create an encouraging banner, but we're gonna do it a little bit differently or in just slightly different roles. Um, so you can create a big banner or a tiny one. Um, so you might want to, let's say you don't have a lot of space and you just wanna make a little banner or you want something big that can be seen outside. Um, so it's your choice if you make a big one or a little one. And I have two examples here that I made. Um, they're both quotes from E.B. White's Charles, Charlotte's Web. Um, so on the left, you see uh, where I took some of the paper um, that you, it's the same paper you guys got, the, not the thin kind in a roll, but the flat kind. 
Um, and I used the colored pencils and made a banner and then strung it together with yarn. And on the right, um, you'll see uh, these are scrap paper that I had that I just cut out letters and I used dental floss. And I taped it up on, um, I glued it to the dental floss and I taped it up on my window. So here you can see that technique I was talking about. I cut out each letter of the scrap. These are actually little film cardboard box. And then I um, flipped the letters over and used glue on the back. You could use tape too. Um, it would actually, I think, be even harder to do it that way. Um, and so if you're interested in, you know, you want to conserve space, or let's say also you're just a private person and you, cause you're going to have to photograph this and you're going to have to photograph it in a public, you know, quote, public, your family includes being public space. So if you want something small where you can put up on a fridge or a wall and, and still keep anonymity and photograph it, that is totally fine. Um, or you can go big and make these great big letters and string them. Um, I used yarn for my for that one. And here I am. Um, I've used color pencil to kind of outline the letter. And then I've gone back with that foam brush and some water. Because these are watercolor pencils, um, you can spread after you draw. You can then go back and smear or spread that color. Um, so I've used it to create, um, you know, kind of a bolder background. Um, so you can either go small or big, and um, the rules of the assignment are um, that you're going to decide on a word or, an, or a sentence for an encouraging banner, because so it can be one word, and it can be a full sentence. Um, you can draw or cut out each letter of that word or sentence um, on a different piece of paper. Um, and then you um, will take them and you'll put them on a string or some kind of fastening so that you can hang them up as a banner. Um, you must create these letters. I do not want you to just print them out of a printer or to go to a big book of letters or cut them out of a magazine. I want you to actually craft the letters. Either way, through drawing or cutting out or collaging, it's all fine. Um, but I do want you to create the letters. Then you need to attach them to string um, and then hang your banner in a public place for your family or people passing by your home to see. So if you um, hang your banner in a public place um, that is outside of, you know, for your family, you just can hang it in your home. But if you hang it for the other public, the bigger public, then you, you know, a window is a great place on a fence in the yard is great. First thing, though, you need to practice is safety. So if you're not going outside, do not feel compelled to go outside. Um, if you do go outside, please do so in a very, very limited safe range, which is staying close to your home and putting it in somewhere where it's safe to put up and people can see it, but you're not getting close and you're not inviting them to get close to you. So once again, safety first. Um, but in the home is completely fine. You can make a tiny banner and put it on your fridge, a big banner and put it over the couch. Um, and once again, uh, also respect your own personal boundaries. So if you want to not show a lot of where you live and just show the, the piece on a white wall, that is absolutely fine. You can explain to us how it's public. Um, and you can even put the text when you upload it and just say, this is in my living room or this is, you know, on my front of my bedroom door or something like that. Um, do not put yourself in an uncomfortable situation. So please, Respect first what makes you the most comfortable about displaying imagery um, of where you're putting this. You're going to photograph this and upload the image to our website by Critique Time next Monday, April 6th. Um, please let me know if you have any questions. I am happy to respond anytime this week. It doesn't have to be during attendance time, although that is a great time to ask questions too. Um, all right. Have fun, and I am excited to see what you do.